Can we turn the volume down just a little bit? Or? <laughs> it seems a little loud, but... <laughs> okay, anyhow, all right. Uh, I don't know how that works. Okay, what I want to do today is to talk about uh, collective behavior and networks of neurons. And this is a very rich subject. Uh, it has a long theoretical history, uh, which I'll sample lightly. And it has been uh, revitalized, I think, by um, the possibility of recording the activity of very large numbers of individual neurons in animals as they do uh, various complicated things. Um, so, again, as I tried to emphasize yesterday, what's changed in the relationship between physics and biology uh, over this last decade or 20 years is the availability of uh, much more very high quality data um, on many more different biological systems. So, let me um, give you a little outline of what I'm going to try and do. So first of all, although I really want to talk about uh, networks of real neurons or real neural networks, I will start by talking about models because all of the things that we do uh, that, that involve engaging with experiment rest on this long uh, foundation, this broad foundation of theoretical developments. Um, I'll give you a quick reminder about experiments, how one actually does things. And then I'll take two different uh, data-driven approaches uh, to trying to understand um, the behavior of, in fact, the same network, um, which is uh, partly a coincidence, but maybe is also useful um, that we stay talking about the same little piece of the brain. And the first approach, we'll be using maximum entropy methods. And the second approach will be to use methods which are inspired by the renormalization group. So let's talk a little bit about models. Um, if you want to think about a network of neurons, you've already learned a certain amount about this from, from, uh, from Mauro and from, from Cabo. So, uh, the tradition is I want, I want to describe the activity of one neuron, and I'm going to call that sigma i, which is at time t. And it's worth noting that this is already a drastic simplification. So the notion that there is a single variable that describes what a neuron is doing is clearly an approximation, and it's a drastic approximation. So you say, well, wait a second. Neurons communicate with each other through action potentials. So if I keep track of the action potentials, I've kept track of everything. Well, it's not true. Okay? The dynamics that generate those action potentials are uh, the dynamics of ion channels in the cell membrane. A typical neuron in your brain has seven, eight different kinds of ion channels. So first of all, each, to describe the dynamics of each ion channel, you have to tell me about how it opens and closes and at what voltage that happens, how fast it happens, there are different kinds of gates 
called activation gates and inactivation gates. If you want to write down a microscopically realistic model of a single neuron just to capture its electrical dynamics, you would be writing down a model that had more than 50 parameters, one neuron. Furthermore, and this will actually be important in how people make measurements, when the voltage across the membrane changes, not only do you get ionic currents flowing that are part of the electrical dynamics, but some of those currents are carried by ions like calcium. And when calcium enters the cell, it can trigger all sorts of biochemical processes. So you have this world of electrical dynamics and ion channels, which then, through the medium of the changing calcium concentration, is coupled to an enormous world, or if you want, another network of biochemical reactions which are happening inside the cell. And some of those processes, in fact, most of those biochemical processes, have time scales which are much longer than the time between action potentials. So that means that if you're only keeping track of the action potentials, you're missing variables inside the cell that carry memory for longer than the time between action potentials. So if you want to, you can only think about the action potentials, because that's the information that neurons use to communicate with each other. But there is absolutely no reason to believe that, those sta that the states described by all the action potentials obey a Markovian dynamics. Because you know that there are other variables in the system that have memory that's longer than the time between action potentials. Okay. So saying that you're going to write down a description of neurons in which there is a variable that characterizes the activity of the neuron, you've already done a lot of violence to the microscopic reality. Now, that's OK, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. But you should know that that's what you're doing, OK? You shouldn't pretend that because you're keeping track of every action potential, everything's now exact, OK? Also, when you talk about the activity of neurons, you have choices you could use very fine time resolution and track every single action potential. You could take a more coarse-grained view and say, well, I'm not so worried about what happens on the millisecond time scale. You'll recall action potentials have a width of about a millisecond. They seldom come closer than a few milliseconds. Typically, they're spaced by tens, if not hundreds of milliseconds. So you say, well, I'm not so worried about what happens on the time scale of milliseconds. I'm going to average over a longer time scale. 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, depends who you talk to. It might also, of course, now, if you average over a wide enough time window, the discrete action potentials blur into something that looks more continuous. So maybe your activity can be a real number instead of something discrete. It's also true that many of the experimental techniques that people use now are actually monitoring not the electrical activity, but the calcium concentration that follows the electrical activity. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And I think you've already heard something about that, but we'll give a quick review. So in that case, activity really is some coarse-grained thing, right? Because that's what you're measuring. So, not entirely clear what this variable is. The simplest thing, of course, would be to say that it's binary, that neurons are either on or off. And again, that might be on or off because I'm looking on a very short time scale, and either the cell produced an action potential or it remained silent. There is a real discreteness to neural activity. And if you look on a fine enough time scale, you might try to exploit that. Alternatively, you might be taking a, a, a more coarse-grained view in time and say, well, the neuron is active and tends to sustain its activity for some period of time, perhaps because the action potentials come in bursts or because of some other dynamics. And so over some longer time scale, you could say, this neuron is active, this neuron is silent. Okay? Or you could keep it as a real variable, some, something like the rate at which the action potentials are happening, the calcium concentration. Okay, you have some flexibility. Let's do the simple case. which is that it's binary. Um, and of course, uh, it depends which department. I actually worked for a while in an institute 
that had physicists and computer scientists. And it's really interesting sociology to watch. Because of course, if you ask a physicist for a binary variable, see, right, up and down, plus and minus one, if you ask a computer scientist for a binary variable, of course you get a different answer, right? Um, physicists who've got interested in uh, the nervous system have a tendency to come from a statistical physics tradition. So we find the plus or minus one thing natural, except of course that that treats the two states symmetrically and they're manifestly not symmetric. Neurons being active and neurons being inactive are very different from each other. So we, we, our, uh, our culture uh, um, constrains us in interesting ways. Anyhow, so of course it doesn't matter, right? Anything, right? just to be clear, uh, but uh, you should be careful because some things that look natural in one notation are not natural in the other notation. Okay, so that's the simplest model. To say, my variables are the activity of a neuron and the activity is binary, the neuron's on or off. So if I want to write down a model, what do I do? Well, it's a discrete variable, so it's natural to think in discrete time. I have a lot of neurons. And the neurons have inputs um, along their dendrites. So here are places where inputs come. And they have outputs along the axons, which can branch. And the places where uh, the output of one neuron touches the input uh, of another neuron are called synapses, as you know. And so the simplest picture you could have is to say that every neuron uh, gets input from some collection of other neurons, and the inputs add up with some weights that live at the synapses, that are characteristic of the strengths of the synapses. So you would say the total input total input to neuron i would be a sum of wij sigma j. So this is the total input and since the neurons are either on or off, the way you're going to decide whether to be on or off at the next moment of time is to compare your total input to some threshold. And in principle, that threshold could be idiosyncratic. It could be different for every neuron. And if you take the algebraic sign of that, then if the input is above threshold, the neuron turns on. And if the input is below threshold, the, in the neuron turns off. Okay? So that, I think, is the simplest model for a network of neurons. Now let's remember, if you're actually thinking about neurons in the brain, in your, in, in your cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that, that you think with, the, that makes us us, also makes mice mice, but uh, don't, get, don't get too uh, carried away. Uh, a single neuron in the cortex receives inputs from more than 1,000 other neurons, most of which, about half of which, are in the immediate neighborhood, and the other half of which are all over the place. Okay. Um, again, to get a scale, uh, your cortex is about one millimeter thick. Well, if you're a mouse, it's a little less than a millimeter. If you're us, it's getting close to two millimeters, but okay, we're a lot bigger than mice, um, in addition, hopefully, to our brains being able to do more. Um, and if you look at one square millimeter of the surface, and you look underneath, there's about 100,000 neurons. This radius over which um, the, dendri the dendrites can reach is about 300 microns. So if I look at the radius around one neuron with which, 
that, and I count how many cells are there in that neighborhood with which I could make direct contact, the answer is of order 10,000. Okay. So the system is very highly interconnected from one sense, in one point of view. On the other hand, it's very sparsely interconnected in that altogether, you know, there's a billion neurons, uh, and every neuron only connects to a thousand of them. So take your pick. Locally, the e connectivity is extremely dense. So these matrices are very, very big. Okay, look, that's the, that's the point. So this model, um, I think, was first written down by McCulloch and Pitts in, I think, 1943. Now, this is actually a very interesting moment because 1943 is, uh, well, okay, again, there's other things going on in the world in 1943, so it's a complicated time in which to do science. But um, if you think about the development of computing, this is after Turing, but before von Neumann. Right, not before von Neumann was born, but before von Neumann did the things that he did in computing, right? So there is a theory of what it means to compute things, but there are no computers. Okay? And that's not that long. Interestingly, that's not that long a period, right? Um, but this sits right in the middle of that period. So one of the things McCulloch, so, so they really were thinking about how does the brain compute things? And if I imagine, I mean, we knew that neurons generate action potentials. We knew that there were synapses. So the, the, sto the, le the story that I told you as motivation for writing down this model is a story that McCulloch and Pitts could have told, and it's not so different from what you actually find in the paper. Okay? We didn't know much more, actually. It's so also, for example, before Hodgkin and Huxley. So we didn't know how these action potentials worked. We knew they were there. So what did McCulloch and Pitts do? They showed that if you build models of this sort and you make different choices for the matrix W, then you can put together little circuits of neurons that could do all of the elementary logical operations. And you know that if you can do all of the elementary logical operations, you can do anything. So they didn't quite prove that this class of models was Turing universal, right? That, that language wasn't really quite there yet, although it's, post, it's after Turing's original work, but that, that notion wasn't so well developed. But they got close. So this is good news and bad news. The good news is that even with a cartoon of what individual neurons are doing, you realize that you have the ingredients for computing almost anything. So that means that neurons as computational devices can be the primitives of an arbitrarily complex computation. So that's, that's actually a pretty remarkable thing to be able to say in 1943. Okay? You have to kind of cast your mind back. The bad news is that if I write you a dynamical system which is capable of an arbitrary computation, I can't predict anything about what it's going to do. Right? Because it has to be able to do anything. So this class of models could do anything. I, I can't say, you know, I can't say it's going to be chaotic. I can't say it's going to go to a fixed point. I can't say it's going to have a limit. Like it has to be able to do anything. So by the proper choice of the matrix WIJ, I should be able to generate an arbitrarily complicated thing. And so in that sense, the, the McCulloch and Pitts result is kind of two-sided, right? It's fantastic, but on the other hand, it, it limits our, our um, predictive power. So from this foundation, two very different things happened. So if you take the basic McCulloch-Pitts model, everything is contained in the matrix Wij. 
right? That's the, I mean, yes, there are parameters which are the thresholds, but okay, fine. All the structure is in the matrix Wij. In the general case, you can't say anything. So there were two very important directions that people went in. One was to say, let's imagine that my neurons are connected to each other in a way such that there are no loops. So the matrix Wij has the property that if Wij is not 0, then Wji is exactly 0. Right? So signals thus flow only one way through the system. So this is um, called a feedforward network. And um, I've drawn it this way because you can imagine that in addition to the neurons all talking to each other, there are some signals that come in from the outside. And so you could start with the neurons that receive signals from the outside. You could ask, what is the set of neurons to which all those neurons are connected? And so on. And you build this layered structure. So this problem, this system, is understandable because it does not actually have any dynamics, right? This layer responds to the inputs. This second layer responds to the first layer. The third layer responds to the second layer, and so on. And you don't, you know, solving the dynamics of the thing is trivial, right? The information just propagates step by step through the network. If you then ask, well, what does it mean to say that this uh, network computes something? Well, what you might do is to look at some output neuron at the end. There might be many of them, but let's think for the moment about one. And let's ask, what has happened in a network like this? Well, I take a set of inputs. It flows through the network. And it comes to the end, and there's one neuron. And that neuron, like all the other neurons, is either on or off. So what that means is that this network has classified all possible inputs into two groups. <clears throat> if I put more neurons here, then I classify into more different groups. So for instance, I could take an image, I mean, in the, the fantasy, right, is you take an image which has a million pixels in it, so there's a million cells at this stage. You pass through many layers. And at the end, you have a thousand cells, which are la with whose labels, wh whose, whose uh, identities, could be defined by saying that neuron number seven is on, if and only if the image that you showed at the beginning is the image of the seventh person on your contact list. So you take images of faces, and you attach names to them. You've done facial recognition. So that's what you can do, at least in principle, with networks like this. The history is that people started by trying to do things uh, just with one layer. And they got very excited because they could do interesting things with one layer. And then somebody proved a theorem that there are obvious things that you can't do with one layer, and that killed the field. It's interesting. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's fascinating, right? I, I have a very large uh, space of theories. I can only do a calculation in this small corner. In this small corner, I show you that there's many interesting things that you can't do. In the rest of this very big field, I can't calculate anything. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is abandon the field. <laughs> OK. Interesting. There came a, rena a small renaissance, uh, which was uh, in the 80s, to um, basically try to uh, learn. So let's take the example of classifying things into two groups. 
Obviously, if I pick these numbers at random, I'm not going to get a classification that makes any sense. So I should try to adjust those coefficients until I finally produce a classification that does, that is correct. And so uh, this idea of training a feedforward network to do a classification, people develop new algorithms for doing it, as it were, experimentally. Uh, let's try this and see how well it works. Um, physicists got interested in this and started to uh, try and calculate uh, 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 how hard it is to do that, how many, how many examples of inputs and yes or no outputs do you need in order to set these weights accurately enough to achieve a certain level of performance and so on. Can you actually do that calculation? It was important that in order to do that calculation you think about random instances of the problem. So imagine that the different inputs are effectively random and randomly assigned to class A or class B, yes and no. And then the problem of figuring out what the weights are becomes a problem in the statistical mechanics of disordered systems. And so there were all these new techniques that had come in the 80s, and so they were immediately applied, and people got really spectacular results. But again, things faded out, in part because if you tried to actually do this, um, you didn't do so well. And then computers became much more powerful and data became much cheaper. And so people started trying to take networks of this form, but not one layer, which we knew wouldn't work, or two layers, which we could analyze analytically, but 15 layers with a million inputs. So I have 15 layers, a million inputs. If I count how big the matrix W is, it's in the billions, right, or more. They said, don't worry, let's just try. Let's try all the ideas that we tried in the 80s, but on these very big networks. And as many of you know, this is the origin of the revolution in artificial intelligence today. It turns out that if you do that, you can reach something like human level performance at face recognition, translation of texts, many other problems that we thought of as being incredibly difficult. Um, nobody knows why it works, because the argument about there being billions and billions of parameters should tell you that it's not going to work um, and it works anyway. And again, the physics community is very engaged in the question of what it is um, that makes, makes things happen in this class of models. Okay? So this part of the, this branch of the story ends, well, ends with modern AI. Okay? It's kind of extraordinary. By the way, this isn't the first time that an attempt to build a model of the brain, which sort of failed and came back and failed and came back, has turned out to have an enormous impact. I will remind you that there was this guy, Boole, the Boole of Boolean logic. If you look at the book in which he introduces what we now call Boolean logic, the title of the book is, if I remember correctly, On the Laws of Thought. Boolean logic is a very bad model for how we think, okay? <laughs> so in some sense, this was a failure. On the other hand, he gave us Boolean logic. So, you know, we should all fail on such a grand scale, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very impressive failure. So the question of whether this is a model for the brain or not, who knows, okay? So if you want one answer, obviously no, because the brain does not have this architecture. There are aspects of brain architecture which are captured by this model, but it is not true that the brain is entirely feed-forward. That's just not true. It's dramatically not true. Whether it's dramatically not true in ways that matter for how we think about the system, that's a, that's a completely different question, right? But if I ask you, is this, a, is this a model? The answer is no. On the other hand, people are actually trying to say, suppose that I train one of these networks to do face recognition, and then I go to this layer, and I look at what these neurons are doing in my model, and then I go to the corresponding layer of the visual system, and I look at what the actual neurons are doing at that layer. Can I make any correspondence between them? And so the fact that that's a scientific activity tells you that this has been a successful enterprise, okay? It doesn't matter whether the end of the, I mean, of course, the first people who did it claimed the answer was yes, 
and I have a theory, and then people criticize, and it goes back and forth, and we don't know the answer, but that's where the field is, right? People are actually having that conversation, which is an interesting conversation. Okay. What's the other one? So this is, you know, wij not equal to zero implies wji equal to zero. What's the other possibility? The other possibility is this one. Let the matrix W be completely symmetric. And then um, it turns out If you let me not worry, I, I can do this with the thresholds, but it's easier to think about without the thresholds. So let me think about the symmetric model in which the thresholds are all zero. Um, it turns out that it's not too hard to show that these dynamics cause this quantity to decrease at every step. So in a world where the connections are perfectly symmetric, in a network where the connections are perfectly symmetric, there's a Lyapunov function. So if you want, these dynamics become zero temperature Monte Carlo on this energy surface. Right? So if you imagine implementing this by picking a spin at ran by picking a neuron at random, updating it, and then picking another one at random, and so on. If you do it synchronously, you have to think a little harder about what's going on, but let's do the random one. Then it's zero temperature Monte Carlo. So, and there's an energy surface, right? And furthermore, it's not just any energy. It's the Ising model. And we know a lot about Ising models. So what's going to happen? Well, the dynamics are zero temperature Monte Carlo. So they're always downhill in energy. So that means the dynamic is going to keep going until you get to a local minimum of the energy, and then it'll stop. So this is a network that starts in some state and then falls downhill and stops somewhere. If you start somewhere else, it could fall downhill. It could be in a different valley, and so it falls downhill somewhere else. So if you imagine a space, well, sigma 173, sigma 247, right? This is a big space. Actually, it's binary, so you know, it sh I shouldn't draw it continuously, but give me a little bit of license. Uh, there's a minimum over here, and there's a minimum over here, and there's a minimum over here. And if I think about the energy landscape, and get some structure that looks like this. And what that means is that if I start anywhere in here, I'll fall toward this one. If I start anywhere in here, I'll fall toward this one, and so on. And so the intuition is that I've built something which is like a memory. Because it has the property that if I give you a hint, that is to say I start you somewhere in this region, you will recover a unique entity, which is the thing you were trying to remember, this thing. Unfortunately, I haven't yet told you how you program this. How do you remember anything? Well, here again, because we know a lot about Ising models, you can figure out the answer. Suppose that I want to remember a pattern which is the vector sigma, C, right? Remember, the states of the neurons are plus and minus one. So a thing that I remember will be encoded by a state of the network. So let me imagine that the state that I want to remember is some particular combination of plus and minus ones. So it's a binary vector C. Well, let me form this matrix, which is just the outer product of those two vectors. Then the energy 
just this. So um, some of you will recognize this. This is um, right. The, the way one way to think about this is that you should uh, make a gauge transformation of your variables. Take each sigma i into xi i times sigma i, and now it's the mean field ferromagnet. So this model is gauge equivalent to the mean field ferromagnet. So you know exactly what the solution is. The, these minima, there can be only two of them, which are related to each other by a symmetry. That's the symmetry I can get rid of if I take the threshold seriously. I have two states that are minima of the energy, and they correspond to sigma being the same as xi, or it's negative. But then you can go a step further and say, what if I do this, so I, I get the same idea, but I, I add together k different patterns. Then in that case, the energy, if you work it out, will turn out to be this. And so now your intuition is that these vectors c define places where if sigma were parallel to xi, and remember it's a binary vector, so parallel means the same, right? Because the magnitude is fixed. If we're parallel to xi, then these dot products would be as big as possible. Now what's important to remember is that if you're in a high dimensional space and you pick vectors at random, then on average they're orthogonal. So is that a familiar statement to most people? Vectors in high dimensional spaces are orthogonal? So let's do the following real calculation. I'm in d dimensions. I pick two vectors at random. I normalize them to unit length. I take their dot product. Of course, the average is zero because you, know, you could equally well be like this or like that, right? Because I chose them at random. So that's not the interesting question. The interesting question is what if I square the dot product? Now take the average of that over your random choices you will discover that if you then let the dimensionality go to infinity, that average will go to zero. That average, of course, is cosine squared of the angle between the two things. So if it goes to zero, that means that the vectors are orthogonal. So in that sense, uh, random vectors in high dimensional spaces are orthogonal to each other. So what that means is that this sum of k terms is basically just like rotating into a different basis for sigma and computing the sum of the squares, right? But then, I, because it's a binary vector, if I maximize my projection onto one of these axes, my projection on the other axes will be zero. So that means that the minima of this energy will be located at the vectors xi. So now I've shown you how to store k patterns in the network. But you'll notice from the calculation, of, from, the, from the explicit expression, that this also contains a very important idea. Suppose that I've gone up to k minus 1, and I want to store the current pattern. Or let me do it a slightly more natural way. Suppose I have k patterns, and I want to take the current pattern and remember it. What do I do? I just add a term, sigma i, sigma j, of the current state. Right? And then that adds one more of these vectors, but the vector is my current state. So why is this interesting? The reason it's interesting is because if you go back to this picture, right, where physically is Wij stored? It's at this connection between neuron i and neuron j. But this connection knows whether neuron i and neuron j are active because it's it, it is the thing that's connected to both of them. But it doesn't know, for instance, whether this neuron is active or any others. So the fact that I can produce a rule for remembering things and storing them in synapses, 
which is sensitive only to the things that are happening on either side of the synapse, is very attractive. It means I don't have to do some complicated, you know, you look at this at the beginning and you say, well, you know, I think about spin glasses, I think about the many minima in the energy landscape of spin glasses, I want to program the system so that there's a minimum over here. The one thing I know about spin glasses is that the evolution of the state is chaotic as a function of the, of, of the parameters. So I think this is hopeless, right? How can I ever program to put, a, to put a minimum here? And the answer is that if the number of things you're trying to store is not larger than the number of neurons, in fact, is smaller than the number of neurons by some reasonable factor, then there's a very straightforward way to do it. OK, this is the Hopfield model. And if you've never read it, I recommend that you read Hopfield's original paper. It's, uh, it's quite beautiful. And it has his characteristic uh, style, which is very nice. Um, why was this so important? Well, first of all, it showed how it's possible to build a network that achieves what's called associative memory. If you think about it, if I put the net, so imagine that, that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to remember faces, or I'm trying to remember events, or I'm trying to remember people and events, right? So you can imagine that the different neurons, there are some of them which uh, go with the name of the person. There are some of them which go with the images that I saw every time that I am with that person. There's a set that goes with the smells of the flower that they gave me or of her perfume, and so on. If I now initialize my network to set some of these, then because of these dynamics, I will be led back to the entire state. So you can imagine actually building a network that would have the property that if I give you the, uh, the, the smell of the flower, you'll remember the person that, that gave it to you, right? And this is a concrete model for doing something that at least looks like that, which otherwise seems like a very mysterious task. Okay? So that was a big deal. It was also true that because of this mapping to, uh, to Ising models with funny, uh, randomly chosen uh, coefficients for the interactions, it again connected to all these ideas in the statistical mechanics of disordered systems. I'll remind you that the, solu the solution of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model is 1979, right? So this was a, a good coincidence uh, temporally. It's also true that people realized that not only could memory be thought of as a kind of a downhill dynamics in an energy landscape, but many computational problems could be cast in that variational form. And that meant that you could build networks that would be, in a sense, programmed to solve these different computational problems by some generalization of this procedure. So you saw a way of connecting even hard computational problems like you know, the traveling salesman or something like that to this kind of network structure and connecting these kinds of networks to ideas from the statistical mechanics of disordered systems, so completing a triangle. And there was one more amazing thing, which is that although this is a kind of cartoon of the dynamics, and you shouldn't perhaps take too seriously that this is a model of a real neural network, or a network of real neurons, it wasn't very long before this that people were actually doing experiments of taking a small piece of the brain out, putting it in a dish, measuring the strength of the synaptic connection between two neurons. So you inject current into one neuron, you cause it to fire an action potential, that action potential arrives at the synapse and injects current into the next neuron. So measure the size of that injected current or the voltage response of that injected current. And what people discovered was that if you start activating the two neurons in different patterns, the strength of that synaptic connection changes on a quite reasonable time scale that you can observe in the laboratory. 
And the form of the change is a bit like this. The change in the strength of the synapse, in a real synapse, right, between real neurons, is proportional to the correlation between the activity of the pre- and postsynaptic neuron, the two neurons on either side of the synapse. Now, that's a, that's a very rough summary of a large, complicated literature, but that was the summary that the experimentalists arrived at. Although they were guided in this because there was this work from the 1940s by Hebb, long before anybody could actually do this experiment, who proposed that if you could do this kind of correlation-based learning at synapses, you could do all sorts of useful things, although he didn't have a very quantitative theory. So the Hopfield model brought together ideas from the statistical mechanics of disordered systems, from theory of computational complexity, from uh, sort of cognitive science and thinking about memory, from ideas that had come from psychology about the nature of synaptic, of synaptic plasticity during learning, and real experiments on synapses. It all came at the same time. So this had a huge impact. Okay. It also connected, it gave us a concrete instantiation for how uh, thinking about networks of neurons bec would become a problem in statistical physics. Because this is a statistical physics model unambiguously, right? In fact, it's, it's even one we know about, right? It's not just, it's not just a model, it's one that we have uh, experience with. And that changed the intellectual landscape. And I think the easiest way to see that is to go to the archive and look at the categories for papers in condensed matter physics. And you will discover that one of the categories is disordered systems and neural networks. So to go back to what I said at the beginning yesterday, there was a view of uh, the relationship between physics and biology, that biology was somehow the, that, that doing the physics of biological systems was somehow the application of things we understood in physics to problems outside the field. Now you, we now arrive at a state where if you look at the categories of papers on the physics ePrint archive, one of the categories has neural networks in the name. Right? So the, the flow went completely the other way. Okay? And all of this grows out of, uh, of these ideas. Okay, good. So this is great. Uh, and I'm just scratching the surface, so there's plenty more to learn about in this direction. But the question is, is this a theory of real brains or not? Right? It's very nice, but, you know, is it right? Well, um, let me make one observation. Uh, I mean, the answer is complicated, of course, uh, partly because, as I said, by the time you write down the model, you've already kind of abstracted away. So it's not clear exactly what you should measure to make a comparison. But there's one very clear idea here, and that is that when you're remembering something, the state of the network that's doing the remembering is a state which is maintained by the activity, by the mutual activity of all the neurons feeding back to each other. So it's not that each neuron got stuck in some state and holds onto it by itself, which of course is possible because there's all this biochemistry that has very long time scales. So that could be how it works. But instead, what this is saying is that the active state of one neuron is being maintained by the fact that the right combination of other neurons are also on, and this adds up to be positive. Okay? So that means that, that the, the state of the system really is a collective state, and the reason that a neuron is active is because all the other neurons, is because the other neurons are active, and the reason this particular neuron happens to be silent is because the right combination of other neurons are active and are, are turning it off, right? So that notion that there is a collect that memory is stored in the persistent activity of neurons and that that's maintained as a collective dynamic those are ideas that you can test. And again, around actually even before this, people did extremely simple experiments. So let's take a monkey. 
and you show the monkey a picture, and then you wait five seconds, and you show him another picture. And you ask, was it the same one? If it was, please push the button with your right hand. If it wasn't, push the button with your left hand. Very simple experiment. It's called delayed match to sample, to hide the fact that it's a very simple experiment. We give it a big name. So what happens during, so if you show an image, the visual cortex responds, but it, if you take the image away, everything goes quiet again in a couple hundred, in a hundred milliseconds or so. So how do you hold the image that you were looking at for five seconds for you to wait and say, what, is this the same as what you saw before? So you can imagine all sorts of possibilities. People started poking around in the brain, and they found neurons that they give a nice big transient response when you show the first image. That goes away when the uh, image is taken away. And then the activity of the neuron just stays constant, not at its resting level, but at some non-trivial level, for the whole five seconds while the monkey's waiting to see what's going to come next. And of course, you do the experiment so the monkey doesn't know when it's going to come, so five seconds is just a rough estimate, right? So it just has to stay there. And you look at another neuron, and it stays at some other level of activity. And you look at this same, you go back to the first neuron, but you show a different image, so the animal has to remember a different thing, and it has a different level of activity. So that's telling you that the state of the whole network of how active each neuron is encodes what it was that was being remembered, but it's encoded in activity which is persistent over time. So that idea that, that memory, at least short-term memories, are stored in persistent activity of neurons, that's very much consistent with experiment. You then have to work much harder to show that that's actually the result of the neurons feeding back on each other but by applying drugs to small regions of the brain that silence neurons and so on, you can show things that are at least consistent with that. So this had a lot of impact. The question is, can we get to a direct connection with data, right? This is all you know, I have this world of the models, and I abs I, the models are an abstraction of reality, and then from the model I abstract certain things which I think are principles, and then I go and look at the real thing and ask whether those principles seem to be instantiated. It's a little bit indirect. The question is, can we get closer? And as I said, and not only, I mean, maybe I won't find exactly this model, but can I get closer and in characterizing the collective behavior of the network, can I get closer to data? And as I said, for many years, the answer was basically no, and the reason was that the best you could do was to record from one neuron at a time. So this would be like trying to understand a magnet by monitoring one spin over time. It's very hard to do. And if you think it's hard in a ferromagnet, it's impossible in a spin glass, right? Because I don't even know whether it should point up or down, right? So I need to be able to see many, I either need direct a way of directly coupling to the order parameter, which I can't do. In fact, if you take the Hopfield model seriously, then the order parameters are these dot products of the state of the network with the stored memories. And the stored memories are, have plus and mi pluses and minuses in them. So the different order parameters are complicated combinations of what all the neurons are doing. So there's no easy way to, to get at those things without actually recording from all the individual neurons. I'll remind you that ferromagnetism was discovered by the Phoenicians, probably, right? <laughs> Lodestone. Anti-ferromagnetism was discovered in the 20th century, right? Because... <laughs> If the spins do this, then they add up to zero. And you hold the thing in your hand, and it doesn't stick to the refrigerator, right? <laughs> On the other hand, the spins are perfectly ordered. And once you can do neutron scattering, you can see it. 
So same problem with the neurons, right? If the ordering is in some complicated pattern, then I can't just you know, average all the neurons together and expect to see something. Remarkably, as I think you've learned about, if you do average all the neurons together in things like EG, you see stuff, okay? And in some ways, that's actually quite mysterious that you should see anything at all. But let's leave that aside for the moment. So what I really want to do is to be able to record from lots of neurons at once. And this has now become possible. So let's uh, talk about how you do it. And let me give you two examples uh, which uh, illustrate two very different techniques. So remember, neurons um, generate action potentials. Those are changes in voltage across the cell membrane, which are about 100 millivolts in scale. All of the currents that support these voltage changes are ionic currents. All of the neurons are bathed in water that has ions in it. So that means that the voltage changes across the cell membrane propagate out into the surrounding ionic solution. And if you just stick a wire, if you just measure the voltage at a point in the solution and compare it to ground somewhere, you will see that that voltage changes every time the neuron generates an action potential, even though you're not touching the cell. So if I, that's how you can record what a neuron is doing without going inside it. And in the old days, you did that by putting in one electrode. So the advance is, can I put in lots of electrodes? So the first place where this really succeeded was in the retina. And that's because you can take the retina out of the animal and put it in a dish. And the retina is flat. So I can make an array of electrodes on a glass slide, and I put the retina down on it. And now, I'm, now I can have hundreds of electrodes contact the retina. So these are experiments from my colleague Michael Berry, uh, not related to the Michael Berry that you might have heard of. Um, and what you see is a piece of the retina, in this case from a salamander. Um, and unfortunately, I've lost the scale bar. Uh, well, I haven't lost the, I've kept the scale bar, but lost the scale, which <laughs> arguably is even more useless. Um, uh, yes, that sounds about right. That's probably 10 microns. So what you see are green circles, which are the cell bodies of the neurons that project out of the retina. And the green cables are places where the long axons of neurons that are off uh, somewhere up on the roof uh, are sending their axons down. They will eventually all come together into a big bundle, which is the optic nerve, which is what connects your eye to your brain. What this figure is meant to show you is that you can see the cells on the cell bodies. They've been, they've been stained with this green stuff. Um, this is old fashioned, so it's not that they make green fluorescent protein, but it's, uh, there's just a green dye. And the whole thing is sitting on a glass slide, and the electrodes are the black dots. And for the purposes of exploring, they tried out dots of different sizes and different densities. And you can see that in the middle, you can get a density of dots, which are the electrodes. So you're picking up voltage at each one of those points, which is comparable to the density of the cells. And so that means you have as many electrodes as you have cells. You have a chance that you'll be able to pick up the signal of almost every one of those cells. Uh, nearly 10 years later, you could build things that were more sophisticated, which achieve this level of density over an area that has nearly 256 electrodes. When you do this, every cell, the voltage signal that's generated by every cell, shows up at many different electrodes, and each electrode picks up many different cells. So if you look at little uh, five millisecond segments of the data, this is five milliseconds of data from whatever it is, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, 30 different electrodes. And what you see is all sorts of bumps and wiggles. The blue are the actual bumps and wiggles. And the yellow is a reconstruction of what the signal would look like, assuming that whenever cell number one generates an action potential, it shows up in a stereotyped way across all the electrodes. And when cell number two generates an action potential, it shows up in some different stereotype way. And you can see that that actually works. You can reconstruct everything. 
And that means you can turn these voltage signals into a little dot every time cell number 57 actually generated an action potential. And in fact, you can even, if you want to, inject current into these cells, make them generate action potentials, and check that you got it right. Yes? Ah, so each electrode picks up the signal from many different cells. And each cell shows up on many different electrodes. So it's not true. You might have thought, oh, in the old days, I put one electrode in, and I put it very close to one cell. And so one electrode, one cell. So 100 electrodes, 100 cells. Well, yes, but it's not so simple. Because <laughs> somehow the, there's some rotation between the, there's a linear transformation between cells and electrodes. You're in, a, you're in a medium, right? So if I have sources, I mean, think about it this way. Each cell is a source of current, and you measure voltages, and you're in some resistive medium. So there's some green function that takes you between the sources and, and your measurements. And you have to figure out what that is. But of course, the geometry is incredibly complicated. So you don't know what that is. You have to learn it. And the way you learn it is to use the fact that the signals generated by each cell are stereotyped. So you're not allowed to look at a little snippet of data and make up a story about that snippet of data. You have to use a, a fixed small number of templates to reconstruct the whole signal. And you can do this such that your time resolution is milliseconds, and then if you want to, you can discretize the data and make a kind of matrix, uh, you know, like the movies um, thing of, uh, you know, here you've discretized. In each little time window, each neuron is either on or off, and we're back to this picture, um, except somehow this is the computer scientist's uh, um, convention. I think that's because pluses and minus ones don't fit as neatly into a matrix. I guess we could have done ups and downs. OK, so this is in the retina. Today, there are various uh, uh, kinds of electrodes that people are making that allow you to put lots of these electrodes into central brain regions in an animal that's walking around and doing stuff. Okay? And this has undergone many uh, generations. Um, there are people today, for example, that are using electrodes that are basically made out of plastic so that they're flexible, so that when you put them in the brain, you don't sort of tear through the tissue. Um, the problem with trying to stick lots of electrodes into the brain is you turn the brain into a pincushion. You might worry that that will impair the performance of the animal, and it does. Um, on the other hand, these plastic things, much softer, tend, they tend to sort of gently push tissue out of the way rather than tearing it. Um, and so this is, you know, the state of the art is to be able to put uh, hundreds of channels of electrodes into some small region of the brain. Okay? Again, in a wake behaving animal. The alternative um, is shown here. And what you do is you genetically engineer the animal so that it makes one of those fluorescent proteins that we talked about yesterday. But the fluorescence is somehow sensitive to the electrical activity of the cell. One thing you might try is to build a fluorescent protein that inserts itself into the membrane and changes its fluorescence in response to the voltage across the membrane. Fantastic idea. Lots of people are trying that. It almost works. Okay? I mean, of course it works. The question is, does it work well enough that if you put it into an animal and you, everything will, will be fine? And it's just on the edge. So if we have this conversation in two years, the answer will probably be it works and that's what people are doing. It's getting there. The next best thing which actually got, people got this to work much earlier, is to make a fluorescent protein that goes inside the cell, not in the membrane, and changes its fluorescence because calcium ions bind to it. And as I said, whenever you have an action potential, calcium flows into the cell, and then is eventually, it can do all sorts of things while it's there. It is eventually pumped back out, and so, among other things, it can bind, the calcium can bind to your favorite indicator, and you get a signal which is following the calcium concentration. And of course, it doesn't follow the calcium concentration instantaneously because it takes time for the binding to equilibrate, but it's also true that the calcium concentration doesn't follow the electrical activity instantaneously, so you get something that's a little smoothed out in time. But what you've done is to convert, aha, it doesn't work if you don't put the thing in. Um, 
what you've done is to convert the problem of recording electrical activity to the problem of doing microscopy, um, which, again, there's been a revolution in optical microscopy, so you can do much better. Um, let me remind you that in order to actually tell the cells, I mean, you're not done, because in order to tell the cells apart, right, you have to do this with a resolution where you can see the single cells. That's not so hard, because cells' bodies are 10 microns across, but they're packed together very tightly. So you have to be able to see the spaces between them, which are submicron. So you really need to push to the resolution limits in order to be sure that you can tell all the cells apart. Now, you might not want to try and do microscopy at, uh, at the limits of resolution in an, when the sample that you're trying to record from is running around. Some people are trying to do that, and that's really interesting that you can build a microscope that works while it basically mount a microscope on the head of an animal so it carries the whole microscope around with it. It's a small microscope. But the alternative, which was uh, kind of fabulous, in uh, my colleague David Tank's lab, is this. Here's a mouse, and you take the mouse and you hold him down by the head. So the part that you want to see doesn't move. Well, it moves a little bit, but it doesn't move as much as it would if you were running around. But there are lots of things that you would like to study that don't work if you just hold the animal still. For example, you know, there are regions of the brain that are involved in navigation like the place cells in the hippocampus or the grid cells in the interrhinal cortex. These are fantastic things, but they don't work if the animal can't actually move itself. So what you do is you let him run on a styrofoam ball, which you suspend with a col on a column of air. As he runs, the ball rotates. You use a different kind of mouse to monitor the rotation of the ball. You take the signal from the rotation of the ball and feed it to a computer which projects onto a, a kind of IMAX-like screen that wraps around the animal virtual reality. And so this little mouse is running in a virtual world. And you have put on top of this um, an incredibly sophisticated microscope. This is actually a scanning two-photon microscope. Well, <laughs> You can't tell that by looking at this gray box, but the one in David's lab is a scanning two photon microscope. Um, and uh, there are all sorts of interesting, there are good physics reasons why you want to do two photon microscopy rather than one photon microscopy. Uh, let me remind you, just to, just to give you a sense of what's going on here, right? You normally think about microscopy, you take a picture, right? You look through, you get an image. No, no, no. This is scanning microscopy. So you take the beam and you focus it to a very small spot, and you excite in that spot. And remember, you're exciting a fluorescent molecule. So all the excitation happens in this spot. The fluorescence goes out. You collect all of it. You don't care which direction it's going in, because you know it all had to come from the spot that you were exciting. So you collect all of it to be as efficient as possible. And then you scan your spot. And then you reconstruct the image. This, of course, requires you to move the beam very fast. Right? So this is um, the, the thing that I think, so again, I'm a theorist. I can speak with unembarrassed appreciation of what my experimentalist friends do. Let's think about how this works. First, you have to genetically engineer the mouse so it makes the molecule that glows in the right way. Then you have to build this very fancy microscope, which um, the reason that this is a slightly misleading picture, of course, is that um, in order to do two-photon microscopy, you have to reach intensities which are enough to trigger two-photon absorption, which means you use extremely high-powered pulse lasers. So, you know, the optical table is, uh, is this big, right, that the, the laser sits on. You then have to route the beam uh, to this spot. It has to be focused to a diffraction-limited spot and you have to be able to scan it very rapidly, so you have to be able to do all of that physics right, and then you have to be able to do the sort of computer science job of building virtual reality. Uh, there's a small footnote to this, which is that the very first versions of the virtual reality, uh, at their core, there was a gaming engine. And uh, David and I joked about this, that this was the revenge of our children's generation on us, 
because we, of course, told our children that playing video games was a waste of time, and we were wrong. So, <laughs> um, okay, so by doing this, right, you end up, so now you have to process these images, and you focus in on this one cell, and you see that, ah, there it went on. Hmm, I seem to not be able to find one that goes on. Let's, let's try that one. Goes on. On, off, eventually it comes back on because the video runs in a loop, so it must come back on. <laughs> it would also come back on if the animal were running around. Anyhow, so you have to draw a circle around each one of these cells, and then you get the trace of fluorescence as a function of time. Okay? That's not trivial, right? Because sorting this, there are some of these where it looks obvious, right? But then there are also these little funny looking pieces. Are those cells? Are they the same cell as something you see in another part, and so on? So it's in the same way that there's a problem of sorting electrode signals into action potentials from individual neurons, there's a problem of sorting these optical signals um, into, the, into, into electrical signals from individual cells. But what you should think about is that instead of now trying to understand a magnet by watching one spin, what I can do is I can watch 100 spins or 1,000 spins, and I can show what you should imagine is that there's some big Monte Carlo simulation going on in the background, and it's spitting out configurations of these 1,000 spins, and I'm showing them to you. And from that, we're going to try and learn something about the under, you know, what's the Hamiltonian that describes this system? Okay. Take a coffee break, but questions first. Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Okay, so, um, so um, it's a great question. So there, there's several levels of answer. So the first thing is, what you're pointing to is that it is not only true that this is an oversimplification of what neurons are doing, but it's also true that in this picture, um, aside from whether, aside from the, the algebraic sign of W, that is to say, is this a neuron that activates other neurons or is it a neuron that inhibits other neurons? There's no room to talk about different types of neurons. And we know there are lots of different types of neurons by whatever criterion you want to use. Let me remind you that the electrical behavior of neurons depends on ion channels. Your genome has 100 ion channels in it. Each cell chooses from that 100 to make some cocktail of seven or eight of them. So there are many different types of, of neurons. Okay? And somehow, this isn't here at all, qualitatively. right? So is that important? Is, can you somehow uh, lump all of that into uh, the interactions W? Do you need to give different dynamics to the different classes of neurons? People work on this. They work on it at different levels. They work on it at the level of taking models like this and saying, what if I had two kinds of neurons? I don't know. One of them does this, but on a short time scale, the other one puts a little averaging of this over some longer time scale. I, OK, we can try different things. Maybe um, some neurons effectively excite themselves so they can oscillate, and other neurons don't. Other neurons maybe inhibit themselves so they have a refractory period. Mm, 
There's a huge activity of trying to make microscopic models for what the individual neurons are doing. This has actually peaked. I mean, in, uh, 20 years ago, that was a very big project. Um, it works. If you find all the channels, you can reproduce the behavior of the neuron. Um, and there's a lot of different kinds of channels, and that's complicated. Um, by the way, lest you think that none of that's important, there's an enormous apparatus that's devoted to switching which kind of channel you use at different times during the development of the animal. So if it didn't matter, why does, why does the brain bother changing channel type 7.3 for channel type 5.2, okay? Uh, it, it must be there for something, but we don't necessarily know what. Another layer of answer is that you can identify channel, you can identify neuron types by certain molecular markers. So not only do they make different combinations of channels, but they might have a, a particular class of neurons might have the property that it expresses one particular transcription factor which turns on the expression of a whole set of genes, possibly including some ion channels. And so that means that I can find that neuron, that class of neurons, by looking for that transcription factor. You say, well, okay, so that's a hard experiment. But now, remember that when I do this experiment, I genetically engineer the animal to make, have it make these molecules. But that making of proteins is under the control of the usual apparatus for controlling gene expression. So what I can do is to put the calcium indicator under the control of the same thing that controls the making of a molecule, which is a marker for neurons of type 7. And then only the neurons of type 7 will light up. So I can look and I can, do the, I can do this experiment in a way where I can tell the types of cells apart. So I can start to ask, do the different types of cells play different roles in the circuit? So that's a direction which lots of people are going. Yes? Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. So, for example, so first of all, you could just ask, do I understand synapses? Forget about the whole network. Yes. Just go study synapses. That's a pro Yes, absolutely. So if you want to understand synapses, you have to think about, about biochemistry, what all these molecules are doing. So now the question is, is that just complicated, or is there something deep there? So first of all, somewhere in there, there are the real mechanisms by which neurons change their properties in response to your experience. And we think that that's how you learn. So you might care about the answer, right? It's an important problem. What drugs actually? It's, uh, some drugs, yes. Um, there's a deeper point. Suppose you take the Hopfield model seriously. And you say, well, I'm going to do this thing of trying to remember things. There's a problem, which is that if I keep doing this, right, if I, this idea that I have random vectors and so they're all orthogonal with each other, that obviously doesn't work if k becomes comparable to the number of neurons because, you know, there's only so many directions in space. So if I keep trying to remember things, I will make a mess. And in fact, I will effectively overwrite the things that I've remembered so in conventional language, or our conventional language today, if I keep trying to remember things, the problem isn't that I forget. The problem is that I overwrite, because I have a limited capacity. So in order to secure that, you should forget, to be sure, because if you overwrite, you can get confused. And that doesn't, you neither remember the old thing nor the new thing, you just make a mess. So you should forget some of the old things. But then, you know, that's a problem, because you forget old things, and 
there's a kind of, it's a sort of zero-sum game. So what people argued is that you can get out of that zero-sum game if the dynamics of forgetting occurs on multiple time scales. Okay. But then, how do you do that? Well, you have to look inside the synapse and find that the network of biochemical reactions is rich enough to generate the multiple time scales. But, and in that case, all of that biochemical complexity that at one moment we were willing to say, oh, I don't care about this, I don't want to, I don't want to study that, now it becomes essential because its job as its own network is to generate a hierarchy of timescales. In fact, there's probably enough complexity to generate almost the continuum of timescales so that you have a kind of power law for getting which is not emergent from the neural network, it's emergent from the biochemical network that's inside each synapse. Okay. So, pick your problem. Which, I mean, there's a lot that we don't understand, right? And, and what, at one point, so what from one point of view is something you want to say, no, okay, I, I don't want to do that part. You may find that that then becomes, at some point you run into that as a problem, and you switch your point of view. So it's not that, that you want to add the complexity for the sake of adding the complexity. Sorry, let me be respectful of the distinction that Maxi drew yesterday. You don't want to add the complication for the sake of adding the complication, right? If there's something there that generates a richness that's actually functional for the, for the whole organism, then you care about that, right? Yes? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So as soon as this was all done, people said, but wait, why should the attractors be point attractors? They could be limit cycles. They could be strange attractors. They're actually more interesting and exotic. That, well, strange attractors are pretty exotic, but they could also be other possibilities where instead of remembering discrete things, what if you have to remember a continuous variable? Well, then in that case, you need a kind of line of attractors. And there, there are very simple examples of that in, in behavior. So, yes, I mean, it's, been a, it's before you were born, right? <laughs> so I have a question. Yeah. You, you say that uh, for, in order to get this, the, sort of this kind of spark, spike yeah. source in there, Mm -hmm. You have to have templates of. Yes. So where do you pick up these templates? You learn them. So, um, so let's say E are the electrodes. The voltage that you see at one electrode should be a sum over all the neurons N and all the spikes that each neuron generated of some template that is specific to the neuron and is centered at the moment of the spike and, of course, there'll always be a little noise left over. So what you now do is um, you basically try to fit this model to your data. And the point is that you have a very long, you, know, you have an hour of data, and these little things are a millisecond wide. So you have many, every neuron shows up many, many times. The simple way to do it, so look, if the spikes never overlap, then it's easy. So you look for things, you start by looking for things like this that are plausibly one cell firing and nothing else. So, and then you take, you cut out all of these pieces and you average them together 
And you say, that's my first guess for all the templates. And now that I know the templates, I can find all the spikes. Then I go around a few times. And then I take all of those out, and I see what's left. I and I do it again and again. Now, there are more elegant ways of doing it, but conceptually, that's what you're doing. If you find a nice, big, isolated spike, okay. that's one template. Okay. Sure. No. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Ah. Maybe like by the topology of the network. So, um, so it depends on where depends on where you're recording and what's going on in the virtual world. Um, this experiment is in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. So this is a region where you have the famous place cells. So, let me say this now, so I don't have to say it later. For those of you who don't know. Uh, place cells are these remarkable things that were discovered uh, by John O'Keefe and his colleagues, where you stick an electrode in the hippocampus of a mouse, you let him run around, and whenever he sits, stands here, uh, the neuron fires, and as he runs around the rest of the room, it doesn't fire at all. So it is a place cell because it's active only when the animal is in this place. Okay. This is an extraordinary discovery, um, shared a Nobel Prize. Uh, a remarkable fact is that, of course, the collect there's lots of these cells that are selected for the different places in the environment. Um, together, they form what we think of as a cognitive map. The animal's map of the world is somehow represented by the activity in this population of cells. And if you could lay the cells out in space in the same way that they represent space, then exactly as you describe, you might see a bump of activity, which are the cells that are in this neighborhood all being active, and then it moves around. The cells are not physically laid out in that way in the brain. And so that structure is not apparent just by looking at the image, which surprised many people, but it's true. I mean. You already knew this from poking around with electrodes, that it, if, if that were true, you would have seen something already. So that by the time you saw this and it's not there, nobody was surprised. But it, I think most people would have guessed that it would have been, uh, that the map would have been mapped. And it's not. So yes? Right, so, the, right, so the, the, the classic example of a map is, um, is your body surface. So if you look at the region of your brain that is uh, the first place where touch receptor information arrives at your cerebral cortex, then as you go across the surface of the brain, you actually map out space on your body. Um, and it's also true that the space is apportioned in relation to the density of touch receptors in that region of your body, um, which results in your hands as well, the, as well as other interesting parts of your body being greatly enlarged on the surface of your brain um, and other parts being uh, very compressed. So you get a kind of distorted image of the body uh, stretched out over the surface of the brain. So that's an example where you have a direct mapping, and, but not in the hippocampus. It seems like in the hippocampus you've extracted the notion of place is a much more abstract notion than, than position on, your, on the body surface, or even then position in space visually. Coffee? Mm-hmm.